thank you for having me, first of all. Um, so Digital Orchard as a company, um, we're about 10 years old now. So, um, you know, not, not fresh faced, but we're not, you know, crazy established um, in the industry. We started off um, by offering just DIT services. Um, so I came to the industry as a did, um, and I'll, I'll come on to sort of my story in a minute. Um, but we started off as a, a collective of DITs, pooling resources and kit together. That then grew slightly bigger and we brought on more technicians. Um, and then we expanded into video ops. Um, so we brought on um, lots of playback video ops um, and then brought on assistants to work with them. And then the next natural progression was the lab work, the digital lab work. So we ran a lot of dailies labs. Um, and what we became very good at quite quickly um, is doing quite difficult shows. So productions that were going away to, you know, the middle of nowhere where there was no power or no internet. Um, so we worked all across the world. We worked in, you know, in the deserts, in, in India, in Egypt, in um, you know, South America. Um, and we would take our labs out there. Um, and that was one of the sort of first big differentials was that the, the traditional post-production facilities simply didn't have the experience and knowledge to be able to take um, digital shows sort of out and about. Um, so we did that um, and that sort of naturally grew um, until we were doing pretty major productions. So we run the gamut of you know, big Hollywood, 200, 250 million dollar films. Um, so we do typically sort of between sort of, I would say eight and 10 big budget films a year. And then um, we probably do maybe 20, 25 sort of mid budget things, the sort of 10 to 1 million pounds projects. Um, and then we do um, quite a lot of uh, sort of terrestrial TV budget work. Um, and initially we, we did do quite a lot of um, commercial stuff, but we tended to move away from that towards long form. Um, and then we rather boldly took the step of offering um, film as a service. So 35 mil traditional um, film film. And uh, we created a partnership with Kodak um, and we have become Kodak's um, digital scan partner uh, in, in Europe. So anything that goes to the film lab, um, which is based at Pinewood, anything that goes to the Kodak lab, then comes to us automatically for scanning. So we have a scan department, we've got um, two very high-end scanners, um, and again, we've always tried to differentiate ourselves. So in the scan world, we do 65 mil film scanning, which is um, sort of what IMAX is shot on. So um, it, it's very specialized. There are only three facilities in the world who can do 65 mil scanning work and we are one of them. Um, so we, we sort of, you know, we've always thrown ourselves in, um, especially when there's sort of new technology involved. Um, and then our recent sort of evolution or, or growth has been into post-production. Um, so about 18 months ago, we brought on a couple of colorists, um, head of post-production and have been expanding our facility. Um, so we've got three HDR rooms, we've got a grading theater. Um, and I think the next sort of logical progression will be moving towards audio as well. Um, so you can see what, what we've sort of grown from little and on set to, you know, pretty much encompassing the entire workflow. So I've just got a couple of questions just to unpick some acronyms. So what you said you started out was DIT. What does that stand for exactly? Just so everybody can. So a DIT is a digital imaging technician. Um, it is a role that exists just on digital shows. Um, so in the good old days when all there was was film, um, you would shoot your film on traditional film stock. Um, a loader would then take that out of the camera, you would then send that off to the lab for development and then it would get scanned and then seen. Um, in the digital world, you need someone to sort of perform that in between role. So you've still got your DP and your loader, but instead of shooting onto film, we shoot onto um, little SD cards or mags or codex mag, whatever sort of medium we're, we're doing um, with that particular camera. And then it's the DIT's job to make sure that that footage is, is downloaded safely, um, is transcoded into whatever formats need to be sent to editorial or VFX. Um, 
So at, at the most basic level, the, the DIT is there to make sure that the workflow and, and all the data flows smoothly from camera all the way to set, all the way to post-production. Um, there's, there's lots of other sort of things they do in terms of they'll do some live grading work and checking exposure work with the DOP very closely. Um, but that's sort of where the role came from. Um, and I was sort of in that first generation of people um, jumping in as DITs because I, I, it was, you know, right, right time, right place really for me. So you get involved in probably when that role was emerging then, that role was kind of... Absolutely. So I sort of started in the industry um, really straight out of university in 2007, sort of eight, And it was just when we were starting to tip from film into real digital. We, we had already had a few sort of digital productions and, and some digital cameras were becoming more popular. But it was the explosion of shooting on um, DSLRs, so things like 5Ds and shooting on red ones. Um, so the, these brand new cameras. Um, and I had been a, um, in fact, I started off uh, just as a runner and then I became a, um, a third AD for a small amount of time, did the tiniest bit of sparking work and then moved towards the camera department, became a loader and sort of switched across from loading to ditting, mostly because there was more work available you could put your own kit on and rent it. So you, you got a higher rate um, all round for it. And then sort of launched myself from there. Mm -hmm. And what was your background at university? Was it always like film, television? It, it was, so I, um, so, so sort of I, Edinburgh born and bred, um, was up there, went to, to school in, in Benally, just in the outskirts of Edinburgh. Um, and always loved film. So that was always my sort of big passion. So I, I always knew that I wanted to work in the film industry. Um, I think like everyone starting out, the assumption was, well, if you like film, you want to be a director. Um, so that was sort of a thought process. So it was a lot of, for me, it was a lot of, you know, watching a lot of Kubrick films, Spielberg films, you know, Lucas, all those sort of, you know, rather glossy, you know, 70s films. Um, and I started making sort of little shorts with a friend. Um, we started doing stuff at school and then went to university, didn't quite know what I wanted to do. And there was an element of it was a sort of safe bet thing to do. Um, and so I went to Royal Holloway, uh, which is one of the colleges of the University of London. And um, they have and still do have a, a really good um, media um, department there. So I studied something called media studies, which is, you know, one of those rather catch-all vague sort of things. And our year was made up, as I'm sure a lot of these things are, by, you know, there was about a third of the people knew what they wanted to do and two thirds of the people were there because they didn't really know what they wanted to do. It sounded like a fun or easy thing to do. Um, so at, at university, there was a you know, quite clear distinction quite quickly um, amongst the, the people uh, the, the, the students there and those of us who really wanted to get involved in the industry just started shooting stuff so um, I ended up behind the camera shooting more than anything um, and doing editing and, and all the sort of technical sides and every time I was asked to do any sort of directing I just didn't I just don't want to deal with actors <laughs> and that's that's really it <laughs> lovely people but needy people um, so I sort of found my position quite quickly as, as someone very technical and ended up shooting a lot of our years um, sort of final pieces um, as a DOP. Um, and, and then that's sort of what I thought I wanted to do. Um, and I haven't ruled it out in, in later life, um, but for the moment, you know, it's, it's, it's the technical stuff and the color grading that, that interested me more. Um, but it was a, it was a, big thing to sort of come away from from Scotland and certainly at the time which must have been sort of you know almost 15 years ago there just weren't that many opportunities in Scotland um, if you wanted to work in film um, so there's always been a, a good TV industry um, it's mostly been Glasgow based um, there's a little bit in Edinburgh but as I'm sure you're all and we're all aware you know what Scotland lacks is, is a good studio and Without a studio, you know, you can't really make big films um, because they've got to have 
you know their studio time um so that that was so i basically moved to where the work is and as i say went to university down at Royal holloway um and then came out of university and have stayed down here since um which is a shame and, and have done bits and pieces of work in scotland but it's not not nearly enough and you spoke a bit about location labs did i pick that up correctly is that where you take a lab like you take um you're basically like your hub and take it on a location and do all the workflow there could you i mean i'm just imagining what this looks like could you describe that yeah that that's ex absolutely that's exactly what we do um so the most recent sort of big thing in scotland that i can that, that springs to mind is um outlaw king um that we that must be two years ago now um they outlaw king wanted to shoot so you know fairly big budget um netflix tv show or, or tv film and we were shooting um some some stuff in glasgow but a lot you know up in the highlands up in um, glencoe you know places that were really remote um and had never really been shot on on the scale that we were going to shoot so and it, we were working with a, um, a production staff who were very experienced and who understood what we needed. And that that's a huge thing for us. Um, so we could have very honest conversations about what was going to be difficult and what was going to be expensive. Um, so we essentially cr built a, a digital lab for them in the back of a, a custom rigged out um, truck. Um, it had a uh, sort of huge bank of UPSs to make sure there was a backup power supply and we took it all over the place. So, you know, wherever the production went, this lab drove with them and then we could process all the material on the go there. Um, Can you just that, that was uh, the logistics in making? So I missed, sorry, you cut out just because we had an interruption. The lab was built in the back of a, a truck, did you say? Yeah, absolutely. So it's built in the back of a truck and we just took it around the place. So, so it all had to be sort of custom fitted out um, for, our, for our needs. Um, and it was great. And what it meant was the DP could come on the truck every single lunchtime and in the evenings um, um, and could see the rushes and, and view exactly what, what they had. Whereas on a lot of shows, you know, you've got a dit in the back of a truck downloading stuff and then no one's really seeing it till it's up online and then you're not really getting the quality that, that you should be looking at yeah so what's what does that mean then to have that close collaboration and, and for just to be able to look at stuff in real time how does that affect what's does that mean stuff can they know they don't need to reshoot stuff how does that affect i, I think it's i think it's a number of things um i think there's there's confidence building for director and dp um and somewhat producers that if they can see everything that's being shot in, you know, the quality that you're shooting it in, then and there, either that day or the next day, I think you know what you've got then. Um, and you can see, you know, especially when it's very dark lit scenes or you've got enormous battle scenes, you need to know what you've got and be confident in it. Um, so that helps enormously. Um, also working with a, a studio like Netflix, you know, they have very, exacting security requirements and safety requirements in terms of your footage um, and they it doesn't really matter where you go in the world they want you to make sure that everything's backed up properly and safely and securely um, so th that was another thing that we knew because it was a netflix show we had to do it in a certain way to make sure that they were happy um, and again it's it's that peace of mind for production is the difference between you know having a one-man band in the back of a truck and having a sort of company behind it who understand the logistics of that on a scale of those productions you know i think was pretty important can i just thanks for that carl can i just ask a question on that note about the differences between the roles in that kind of team between the the, the dits and the data wranglers and the, the the kind of dailies team can you maybe describe to the students what that looks like we've spoken a wee bit to the students about workflow and about the importance of backing up and can you just maybe drill into a wee bit of detail around that yeah so it is the, i guess the first thing to say is it's different on every single production um very slightly is who does what and where they do it but generally um we would say the head of, head of the department would be the dit so the digital imaging technician um on a large-ish scale production so something you know comparable to outlander um 
you would have a DIT working on set. They would be working mostly directly with the DP, doing live grade, assisting with the cameras, making sure you're getting the best out of the cameras, uh, working on things like um, uh, exposure. So they're generally not going to be handling the data themselves. Um, they will then have a team of data wranglers or lab managers with them. So it would be the data wrangler's job to then take the cards from camera, download them on set to make that first copy. They'll run a few um, QCs, uh, so quality control checks on that footage to make sure that it's, it's there um, and that nothing's gone wrong in the recording process. Um, on a larger scale production, they will then offload the, those mags, the camera mags, onto some shuttle drives. And those shuttle drives will then be sent to an offset lab. The offset lab works um, sort of off kilter hours to production. So if production's working nine till nine, the um, lab will work sort of midday to midnight, something like that. Um, and the idea is that rushes are sent on these shuttle drives at lunchtime and at wrap. The lab will then download all those rushes and that lab can be made up of a number of people. So at its basic level, you've got a lab operator um, who's sort of comparable, comparable, if that's the word, to a data wrangler on set. Um, but you can also have lab managers who work slightly above them and then dailies colorists who work above them. Um, so if, if there's a lot going on, you'll have more than one person doing that. Um, but it's that lab who would then download everything again, write the LTOs, which is your master archive. Um, so that's a, a tape based format to, to offload stuff to. You'll then make all the transcodes or, or renders or proxies, um, however you want to call them, and do all the color work. And then that will be sent to editorial, to VFX and to the final post house. Um, so they are the pipeline that all the, all the rushes flow through. Mm -hmm. And any colour, any decisions that the DOP has made on set will flow through that pipeline as well. Um, and on when we are on, uh, when we can, we'll have that lab set up close enough to set that the DOP can come at lunchtime and at wrap to come and see the rushes um, because we will, most of the time we set up some sort of projection room. Um, so we've got a number of 4K projectors that we have put in all sorts of funny places. And, you know, we'll black out a room, we'll project the rushes so the DOP can see them in, in good quality. Brilliant. Excellent. I mean, we, one of the things we've been tr trying to kind of impress upon the students is the importance of that role, that, that wrangling role of getting that footage the media, all the assets, making sure that they're backed up, you know, and trying to kind of, I think what we're, what we're trying to kind of impress upon and what's so good about you coming here today is that when, when a lot of students come on courses such as these, such as the ones that we're trying to deliver, they don't really see the kind of the real nuts and bolts technical stuff that's there and the importance of that as well. I mean, what I've, you know, I've, I think about six weeks ago, I says one of the most important jobs is making sure that the stuff you've shot is safe and secure because otherwise the whole system breaks down absolutely so what what we've always said and honestly we have to have this argument not quite on a weekly basis but more <laughs> than you'd think that you would have to on the scale of shows that we work on is trying to convince producers that this is a really important thing to put money into and that what i always say to a producer is you have spent X amount of money on that shooting day. That could be ten thousand pounds. That could be a hundred. You know, it could be a million pounds worth of stuff that you've got in between the caterers, the set build, the actors. Everything comes down to what you put on that one card, and that if you don't look after that card, is essentially worth what you paid for the entire shoot day. So why would you, you know, risk using old battered hard drives, getting, you know a trainee or an assistant or, or the runner to do your offload. You know, it, it just, it always boggles my mind when people try and cut corners on something that is so critical. Um, and I'm not saying that you have to have a dit and a data wrangler and a this and a that on every single shoot, but there is a baseline that you just shouldn't work without. Um, you know, it's a bit like the old days, you wouldn't 
you know, send your negatives to someone who didn't really know what they were doing with the chemicals, but, you know, they had a bathtub and they splashed the chemicals around, then you got your neck. You know, it's, it's, it's that sort of level. Um, and honestly, we, we have to have that argument continuously. Um, just picking up on that note about um, splashing chemicals about in a bathtub, which is, I'm sure, not what's happening, but I was fascinated with you saying that you are now working with real film and digitising real film. And um, so tell me a bit about that and the, the, the projects that are working are using that. Yeah, so it, it happened, um, as a lot of things do with me, slightly by accident. Um, we, I, when I, so I, I started as a dit and, and have sort of stepped off set um, uh, recent, well, in about four years ago. But when I was a, a dit, I um, worked a lot with a, um, a very nice DP called Harris Sambalukas, um, who shoots a lot of really big budget stuff. Um, but also when he's not shooting big budget stuff, he'll shoot sort of mid to low budget films. And what was happening was that I was doing all his mid to low budget films on digital. And whenever he went to do a big film, so he did um, Thor and Cinderella, the Disney Cinderella, um, when he went to do his big projects, he always shot on 35 mil film. And so I was always just sort of left by the wayside and the whole of the rest of the crew would come with because I was pretty much the only person that didn't have a role on, on a film set. And so it was the end of, I think it must have been about four years ago, we were doing a little film called Denial and he was about to ramp up to do um, Murder on the Orient Express with Ken Branner. And this was going to be a big film, 65 mil um, film, so quite a rare thing. And he was talking about what a struggle it was to get the workflow together. And in, in my wisdom, I just said, OK, well, don't worry, we'll, we'll do it for you. And, you know, a week later, we went out and we bought a scanner for an enormous amount of money <laughs> and um, learned how scanning worked, learned how film worked and sort of got a relationship with Kodak together. And, um, you know, it, it, was, it was difficult at first, um, but actually what we discovered that, that we knew, you know, we knew the workflows better than the people who had been doing film for a hundred years, because once you've digitized your film, yeah. well, it's just a digital file then. And then we got to leverage all that new technology about rendering really quickly, very innovative, fast um, color pipelines. Whereas the, the old school people were sort of very much stuck in the past of, you know, they would do a telecine, which was, it's not a very good quality scan. And then you would sort of send rushes not graded to people. And we just sort of scrapped all that off be slightly because we didn't know better. And we just went forward with, right, well, we're gonna scan in 4K. Of course we're going to scan in 4K, why wouldn't you? Yeah. And then we're going to do our colour work like we normally would, and then we're going to present the best possible picture. Um, and that has developed over the last four years into a really tight relationship with, with a number of DPs who honestly sort of say that it, it's been a bit of a rebirth of film for them because every single day they can see rushes in 4K, beautifully coloured, and they know what they've got. Um, whereas, you know, 10 years ago, five years ago, you know, even to this day, there are some companies who are pushing out very low quality dailies uh, for people to look at. Um, and we then sort of expanded on that relationship with Kodak and became Euro um, Kodak's European scanning partner. Um, so anything that goes to the Kodak lab um, automatically comes to us for scanning. Um, so, which is great to have that sort of feedback loop between us. Um, so anytime there's an issue, anytime there's a sort of any sort of upset with the lab, you know, we are involved in that. Um, so we've got um, two very high-end scanners, we've got uh, two scan ops uh, and a sort of film restoration team, which is another, you know, slightly different bit of the business. Um, and yeah, it's sort of gone from strength to strength. Um, not quite accidentally, but it, it certainly wasn't what we intended to do when we first um, got into it. But it's, and what I love about it is it is a different medium. It's, it's you know, it's exciting, it's, it's new, it's, you know, we can, we can really push technology um, in, in somewhere that very few people are pushing anymore. Um, and we are, we are seeing a, a really big uptick in, in film, um, even from when we started sort of four years ago to now. 
there has been a huge growth in um, TV show shooting film uh, and commercials shooting film. Um, so we do, I would say, three or four commercials and two or three music videos every day, um, which, you know, is extraordinary seeing as, you know, film has been dying for, for 10 years. But I mean, I suppose what you're offering is giving it like this rebirth, like you said, because you're offering the best of both. It's like maybe film people were losing it because it was the immediacy was gone, but you're taking the best of both. The beauty of film and you're being able to then people can work with it in a digital format. So I think that will people fall in love with it again. I'm just wondering about like the industry and the skills that someone would need to maybe come in at entry level in a kind of organisation like yourself, just hypothetically, is, I mean, is there a demand for these skills within the industry and what kind of um, person do you think suited to this kind of role? Um, so, I mean, there is, there's huge demand at the moment. Um, obviously, we've, we've just gone through a little whoops-a-daisy upset for a year, um, but the industry is is busier than we've ever seen it um, and we sort of thought this this was going to happen um, once once the industry certainly in in, um, in the london based film industry got back on its feet got the covid testing um, sorted you know we haven't stopped rolling here and it's been a been a bit slower to roll out um, across the regions but now that we're going you know usually around this time of year we have a bit of a lull so december january february you know usually the, it's quiet and um we have i think 42 technicians every single person is booked people are trying to double book people so there is absolutely a need for technicians and it, it is very busy so this it's a great time to be getting involved um in terms of what we're looking for um it's it's tough you know i think that would be the biggest thing i would say that you've got to be able to stick it out um certainly when i came through originally you know i did a lot of free work which which isn't the way to do it um it, it's not what i'd want to do you know i don't think anyone should be doing a, a day's work on set without being paid something um but you know I, I just need to be honest that that is the reality of the industry it is still you know very much you've just got to be able to say yes to everything um which which is difficult for people um it's also really difficult being based in scotland um you know if i'm if i'm really honest the majority of the big budget work is still london based it is getting better there are more shows going to scotland northern ireland wales um but you know most of the big work is still is still london based um so that, that is something to contend with. Um, and then it's about having that thirst for technical knowledge. Um, so most of the roles in, in my company, Digital Orchard, are more technically based. So if what you want to be is a director or a DP, this probably isn't the sort of place that you want to be starting. You know, what, what we're looking for are people who really like, you know, computers and engineering and, you know, have a very logical mind. Um, there, there, there are a few roles that are more creative. Um, so we, we have colorists um, and assistant colorists who do, who, who do work with us, um, which is a more creative role. But the majority of what we do, especially with the on-set people, it's about, you know, it's about fault finding, it's about having a good base of technical knowledge. Um, and the more you can have on that, you know, the easier you'll find getting involved. Um, and, and then I, I think, lastly, it's just about having a very positive attitude. Um, something I've been told a number of times I don't have, but um, I, I think as a trainee, as an assistant, you know, um, maybe that's the problem. I never really trained and assisted. I sort of just jumped up into being a dit. Um, but as a trainee, as an assistant, you know, it is it is quite tough work it's difficult work it's long shooting hours you know you are working 10 12 hours a day you need to be happy to go and get the cups of tea and to go and get the lunch and to go and move the cables and to go and do this and for you to be able to enjoy doing that um because it, it you know we live in a country that is very cold a lot of the time you know and i i do remember just being cold in the first few years of, of my, my career um i just got one more question it was 
when you were speaking about like the the relationship between film and digitizing film you said a lot about relationships i think that's something that it's kind of hard to quantify you talk about the relationship with kodak that you've developed the relationship you've got with dps working within the film industry and creative industries as a whole could you tell me about the importance of building relationships and having ongoing um, trust i suppose with who you're working with yeah i, I think that's, that's a really interesting question and it's one that i i think i potentially differ from well, maybe slightly differ from how some people approach it um you know i think there are two two schools of thought of go and work for anyone just work 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 and be selective about who you work with and very early on i i had a couple of really really bad experiences working with dops and some producers who were absolutely awful to their entire crews you know a job where we just didn't you know we worked for i think eight weeks and just didn't get paid and you know i wasn't particularly protected on that you know i, I was a very junior person at that point in, in the camera department wasn't protected um I felt a bit let down and so i was always very selective from that point as to who i would work with and for me it, i only want to work with nice people and there are people who are very good very professional but very tough and i myself just don't have a real interest in 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 trying to build relationships with those people because you know i i need a bit more out of it than that um so you know when i was a dit on set i really only worked for about four dps and those four dps between them kept me busy all, all the time um and you know the testament to that i think for me is you know even though i'm not set anymore those dps still come back to me for us to work with them. And that's always been the approach as a company that we've gone with. We, we like to work with nice people, nice crews, build relationships. So, you know, for everyone, you know, for all you guys starting out, I think it's about trying to get into, you know, good camera departments, good, you know, on set, whichever department you're going in, to, you know, to do it, it's about finding nice people and not being afraid to walk away from, you know, from work, with people that you you don't like and and that's easier said than done you know and especially in, you know in scotland where it's even more high pressured and it's it's an even smaller bubble to work with um but i i would say that that will lead to a happier work life mm -hmm. because yeah. otherwise you burn out and and i have seen it in a lot of people you know they just get bitter and you know the divorce rate is just too high in this industry and you know people just don't see their kids and it's got to be worth it yeah yeah you're right you're completely right collaborations relationships working relationships can be tough you take it for granted if you're continually having good working relationships but yeah if something isn't working for you it's not about uh continually be kind of exploited in that that sense um, it's a really yeah. good point for people who are entering the industry, but also everybody that works in Scottish film and TV industry is nice, so we're fine up here. <laughs> 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 um, I would like to throw that open then to the students or Alan, if I feel like I've kind of been asking so many questions, but has anybody else got any questions that they'd like to ask or, or chip in or any um, feedback? Brad's brought one up. Brad's asking, do you think a lot of positions in TV and film are a labour of love? Um, oh, interesting question. I, I, I think to begin with it is, and then it depends what you want to do with it. You can, you know, once you, once you break into the industry and, and start working on good high-end productions, the pay is very good. So, you know, if what you want is money, and you're willing to stick it out and you're willing to work with anyone you know you can have a very good career doing this um otherwise it is a lifestyle choice because there are there aren't many jobs that require you working you know 12 hours a day you know bank holidays sundays all the rest of it you've got to want to do it um and i and i think you know the fact that i came off set showed that i didn't I didn't want to be on set anymore in the way that I did when I started my career. Um, you know, I was tired of missing 
you know, birthdays and, and this, that and the other and, and getting up at five in the morning to drive an hour and a half to go to somewhere that was very cold all the time. Um, heat seems to be a real thing for me, clearly. Um, <laughs> so, so yes, I think, I think it, is, it is a labour of love. Um, you really got to want to do it. Um, and also just the number of people that think they want to be in the film and TV industry each year. You've got to be able to stick it out. Mm -hmm. Sean's asking, what was your favourite piece of work you've worked on and why? So that's easy. Um, so the, the very last thing I ever did on set was uh, Star Wars Rogue One. And I am a huge, huge Star Wars fan. Um, we had had a number of Star Wars shows shoot in the country and I, unfortunately I wasn't part of them. Um, a lovely DP that I've worked with for a long time, Fraser Taggart, um, got the second unit on Rogue One and I had, had sort of come off set about eight months earlier and then basically when he got the job, phoned him up and just said, I'm, I'm doing it with you. Uh, <laughs> did it, sat in an X-Wing, had a lovely time um, and that, that was that. So and then I haven't, I haven't really been back on, on set since. So. Off, off on a high. <laughs> Graham, do you want to ask your question? Uh, I don't know what one I'm writing another one right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when I'm at, how long did you work in the industry for, uh, for free until your talent was recognised? Um, I mean, some would say my talent hasn't been fully recognised yet. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I think I probably did close to, to sort of 18 months um, and I was very lucky and had family based just outside London that I stayed with for free otherwise I wouldn't have been able to afford to do it um, so and I, I my, my mentality then was going on things like um, Mandy and Call Sheet and basically replying to every single you know, job ad, just saying, yep, I'll do it for expenses only, or, you know, and having a car was, was incredibly important. Um, and it's still, you know, bad as that is, it's still an incredibly important role. Anyone that comes to us and, and signs on with us, you know, they've got to be able to drive. Um, so, yeah. Sean's asking, ask sorry, sorry, Graham. Can I ask what you're working on now? Um, I can never remember what we're allowed to say or not. Um, I can also never remember what we're working on. Uh, what we're doing now. We've just started the next season of um, Avenue 5, which is a big HBO series. Um, I can't really... The, the problem always is whatever we're working on now, we're not really allowed to talk about when until it comes out. And then I've forgotten about it by the time it comes out. Um, but all I can... I know it's not very helpful. All I can say is we're very busy. Sean's asked uh, a question about what your your role right now is and how, how you've how you've come from the DIT to the role that you're now in. How did that journey come about? Um, I think it came about quite naturally. Um, I I have a slightly odd odd role um, in, in my own company. So so we've got um, a managing director. Um, we've got a head of post-production, um, you know, we've got a head of film. So we've got people heading up each department properly. And so what I do is concentrate on sort of growth areas of the company. Um, so, you know, three, four years ago, that was film, you know, last year and the year before it was post-production. So I've still got my head in that. Um, so what I really spend most of my day on is, you know, the thinking of the new stuff and then firefighting all the stuff that's gone wrong um which is is a lot and daily um so we've got 40 um dits and video ops and on a daily basis someone's having a problem somewhere um so a lot of what i do is is that sort of relationship stuff is is you know trying to make sure that they're happy the production's happy the dps are happy um so yeah bit, on, bit on of, that on that note column has has anything ever went spectacularly wrong? Oh. And how did you deal with oh, it? I mean, all the time, all the time. It's it's um, you know between you know smashing up cameras all over the place. You know, film is a particular medium that is prone to to things going wrong. Um, so even yesterday on a production, we were doing tests for a, a fairly big film. 
you know, there was an issue in the lab, some film got scratched. So, you know, that's what I was dealing with this morning and we'll carry on dealing with this afternoon. Um, yeah, I think things go wrong and it's a lot of what we try and instill in, in our own technicians is how you react to the stuff going wrong because there's nothing you can do. You know, we are often working at the cutting edge of technology. You know, people are very stressed, strained, stuff is gonna go wrong. So it's about how you manage expectations, how you manage productions, um, and how you manage, you know, DOPs um, when stuff goes spectacularly wrong. Mm -hmm. And yeah. not being afraid to admit that it has gone wrong or admit that you've made a mistake. Um, and, and it's why we spend so much time training our technicians and also writing very clear workflows. Um, so every production that we go on to has a, you know, somewhere between an eight and a 15 page document um, listing, you know, what the cameras are going to be set up to, how we're going to handle the workflow, the, the color, the hard drives. Um, so, and once you've written everything down, as long as you follow that step by step, you should be all right. It sounds like you're investing quite a lot in terms of your staff and the people you work with. I mean, it sounds, it sounds a very important thing. Uh, how, how does that work for you in return in terms of the people who come with you? How long do they tend to stay with you when they, when they arrive? So um, we sort of got a split between our onset technicians and our in-house people. Um, so mostly the onset people, um, so in, in the 10 years that we've been going, we have probably had, we probably had five people leave us. Um, some about half of that for to go on, on to other jobs within the industry and then some of which have been sort of personality issues and other than that everyone who's ever signed up to us has stayed um, oh. so our retention rate for our on-set technicians is is very very high um, and then our sort of staff are you know three four years you know, in some roles, I mean, it's very, very dependent, um, you know, and some people have been here sort of five or six years, um, but we've, we've sort of grown as a company quite rapidly on the um, sort of uh, facility side. So, so a lot of the people are, you know, all within sort of three or four years of, of coming on with us here. So we'll wait and see how long they stay, I guess. And is people working on a freelance basis? Is there a mixture where you've got staff that are employed, core staff, and then um, freelance staff employed as and when you're needed? And so we, so everyone that works within the facility, um, so that's all of our sort of you know film staff, uh, colorists uh, are all full time on with us, and then all of the on set technicians are. Um, it's quite complicated um, in terms of IR35 rules, which is a sort of tax thing um, that you'll all get into at some point, but they are freelance technicians exclusively signed to us. So they don't work with anyone else, they work through us, um, but they are technically freelancers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, I've just got a question on, obviously like Kim, I was quite interested to hear about the, the, the the film scanning and the you know the, the digital imaging side of things. Uh, one of the things that we students quite quickly find when they start shooting is that video, even at even at a low level, the file sizes are quite large. And obviously, all the, 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 the going from from raw footage through to compressing it heavily to get it outputted, etc. On a rough kind of ballpark in terms of high end television, what sort of kind of data sizes are we talking about at the end of the day in terms of storage and archiving and all that stuff? Um, God, that's putting me on the spot. Uh, so I would say we would, a typical TV drama shooting uh, ProRes on any sort of camera, I would expect to create something like a terabyte of footage a day. High-end High-end shows, I would expect something like five terabytes a day. And on a film-based production, we would, uh, so, so we're doing a, a mid-budget TV, mid to sort of high-budget TV drama at the moment, shooting 16 mil, and they're hitting around the sort of three terabytes a day. Um, 
Wow. But on once we get onto the bigger end films, high end films, we can be looking at somewhere you know, between, you know, it wouldn't shock me between 10 and 20 terabytes a day um, shooting something like Alexa 65 um, or, or sort of Alexa LF. Um, and, and then you, you've got to have the infrastructure to be able to back that up quick enough to be able to get those cards back on set in the same speed that you would just shooting ProRes. Um, so it's just about more faster computers. That's a quite an impressive piece of, pieces of kit then you need to kind of deal with that, yeah? That's high end stuff, high end stuff. I mean, what's interesting is it's, there's not a huge, huge difference. You know, we're pretty much Mac based for everything. Um, so, you know, on, it's just more of the same stuff generally. Um, so there's no, there's no huge mystique around it. It's just, if you're going to shoot that much data, instead of one offload station, maybe you need four offload stations. And instead of, you know, one computer rendering, you need six computers rendering. Um, so, you, you know, you can buy bigger, but often what we do is just chuck more at it. Right, yeah. um, and then it means that when they, you know, ramp up, we can put more on and when they ramp down, we can take some off. Yeah. See the archive inside of things, Callum. I mean, you know, you obviously do archive and can you maybe tell the students how that works with the companies that you maybe, that you're maybe working for? Yeah, so um, we do a lot of uh, sort of uh, US studio work. So um, whether that's Netflix or uh, Netflix, sort of Fox, Disney, um, all have uh, very specific um, archive requirements. So at the beginning of a show, they will send us what they want and it will probably be two LTO tapes and a hard drive, something like that. And that'll be the archive they're looking for. And so we just need to manage that in the workflow. Um, so most productions require two LTO tapes every single day. Um, so what we've got in our facility here is a bunch of robots that sort of write away through the night. And on shows that go abroad, we send LTO um, decks out so that they can offload to tape because LTO is a very slow medium to write to. Um, so often they are having to write through the night and only once the LTO tapes are created and those are sort of classed as your master archive, can the mags on set be wiped and reused. Mm -hmm. So what's great is we don't have to make many decisions. They tell us what they want and we, we just have to abide by those, those rules. Takes a bit of pressure off, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Brilliant. Man. This has been excellent, Carl. I mean, what, what I'm trying to kind of impress upon the students is that uh, it's such an important role, you know, the, the, the technical side of, of getting and dealing and managing the, the, the media assets that you get from a shoot and trying to, to get them to look beyond the traditional roles that they maybe see within film and television and to look at some of the back end, you know, behind the scenes technical roles that are out there and that, that are, for me are so important. So this has been absolutely superb for you to come on and speak to them about this. It's very fascinating in terms of how your, how your company is operating. Mm -hmm. Good. Mm -hmm. uh, can you still see me? I, I think yeah. seem to have frozen my... No, I can yeah. see you okay. Uh-huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. Callum, can I ask I a question? Oh, could I ask a question, yeah. please? What, what's the kind of, um, is it mostly, is, is there a good gender divide um, between with DITs and, and people working in that area or is it quite male skewing? I think he's frozen. He said this might happen. Um, they're getting some new internet put into the new location, uh, the new premises. So Callum says this might be an issue. We'll give him a second. He said they might also just switch to audio if that was an issue. So we'll just give him a minute. But that's a great question, Sarah. Like, is there a mix of um, male and female going into the role? Uh, and, I, and I think, I mean, I, I touched on this a wee bit with Callum before we started, but I think it's, um, for me, it's quite interesting that, you know, people, and he's alluded to this, that people do think about the traditional route of kind of, you know, going up through the camera department to directing um, and are almost disappointed if they have to do DIT stuff. And actually, I think the DIT stuff is so important and so well respected and regarded. 
that actually I think considering it as a real career focus, not, not as a means to an end, yeah. but actually as a career focus, as you guys are suggesting, I think is, is really important. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely yeah. Mm -hmm. you're right. If you've got the right skill set for it, if you're passionate about logistics and process and technical problem solving, I think that's yeah. the kind of thing that, uh -huh. oh, here we go. Callum's just rejoining us just now. Hello. Hello there. Hello. <laughs> Sorry, internet, internet failed our end. I'm just asking about the male female kind of split within the DIT department. Um, it's better than it's better than a lot of departments. Um, so out of our our group, um, we are about a third female. Um, it's because it's a it's a newer role. It has been easier. Um, I've found uh, for for females to sort of progress through it. Um, there's less of that sort of slightly institutionalized mentality of you know well this is a man's job. Um, what we're actually finding um, a struggle is is to bring on sort of uh, trainees and assistants um, in those roles. Um, whether that's because there's a perception of you know it, it's not welcoming to um, to females or because it's a techie role and that's not really their place um, is something that we've spent a lot of work with and and um, Kate who works for us has, has sort of set up a foundation um, to look at that and, and other issues about you know progression through the industry um, so we're finding that once once people get in and get themselves established it's fine um, but we're not seeing a very balanced sort of picture coming in. Mm -hmm. Yep. I would love if um, Kate or yourself could share that information with us about the foundation and anything else that you would like to, I mean, I know I'm putting you on a spot to go like recommend something, but anything that comes up you want to recommend now or anything that pops into your head that you'd love for us to share with the students, please do yeah. just forward it on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll talk, I'll talk to Kate. Uh, I know she's run, um, a few uh, really good training sessions about diversity um, in the film industry with um, she's done a couple of with the BSC and some with Biffa um, so yeah no well I know they're all online somewhere um, so I'll get her to send, send those send those around um, I mean it's, it's, you know, it's less of a thing I think I was wondering Callum if you could if you had a a kind of dummy workflow that you could send as well to to the guys because that might be really useful just to see kind of you know your 10 15 pager if you had a dummy yeah, one you could yeah. send, that would be great or a or a schematic that folk could look at to just see how yeah. it all how it runs how it flows i think that's <laughs> yeah. interesting but yeah i think that's interesting because i think sarah's hit the nail on the head i think you know for students to see it at, you know the dit the data wrangler job as a as its own thing its own entity as a way to just you know that is your job when you go into the industry i think is very important isn't it yeah mm -hmm. absolutely um and, it, and it's a job with you know what i've seen is actually a lot of dops have become dits first because so much of a dits time is spent looking at the image um you know watching what's going on looking at lighting checking exposure um you know more than anyone in a way you know on set Really, when you're a dit, it's you know it's the DP, um, the director, continuity, dit, and maybe the gaffer are the ones most closely watching every single shot. Um, so it's I think it's a really interesting role to sort of as a stepping stone if, if that's what you wanted to do. Okay. But it can be a role in its in, a, in its of itself. Brilliant. Thank you, Carl. I guess um, something I should say is the reason that Callum is here today is because Kate, who um, Callum just mentioned that he works with, um, has been doing lots of work kind of connecting with all the training organisations in Scotland because Digital Orchard are really kind of, as, as Callum's saying, really focused on kind of, um, yeah, the next generation um, sharing good practice. Um, and I think you've, am I right in saying, Callum, you've actually got a, a Scottish based office as well? Yeah, we've got, um, we've got one, yeah, uh, Scottish uh, Edinburgh based office. Um, we are, have been 
tentatively waiting for someone to build a studio and the plan has always been as soon as the studio gets built we will go there um so every time someone lifts their head we get in touch with them and hopefully hopefully i think we're all hopeful cool um so has anybody got any further questions i'm just conscious we've, we've keeping you too long Carol. I know one of the things that I had written down that I um, wanted to talk about was, was video, which is something that we do that we haven't really discussed. Um, and I, I, so I think the really, I think we want to talk about um, sort of video and video assistance because it's another part that, so as Digital Orchard, we've got, um, how many now? We've got nine uh, video operators. Um, so video department on set are the people there to go in, set up all the monitors for director, continuity, um, hair and makeup, um, basically everyone that's not the DOP. So the DOP is looked after by the DIT and everyone else is looked after in terms of video by, by the video operator. Um, so that's another role that is, is you know, something towards getting into. Um, I often find that video operators are slightly strange kooky sort of people um, and I'm not quite sure why but they've got their own mentality and you know if, if you don't fit anywhere else in the industry often those people end up in video um, and video assistants are a fantastic way into into on set as well um, and I think being a video assistant is, is a great job because you are running around all the time you are active all day long moving monitors cabling up cameras um, and you you get very close to the action so you, you you get a relationship with a, a director that no one else will have because it's that director is asking constantly for monitors and playback and stuff um and on a sort of a lot of mid-budget stuff often the role of assistant is shared between dit and video so that can be another really good learning um learning way so so if you see video assistant um don't necessarily be scared off is if what you want to do is more of the ditting side of things, it, it, it can be a really good stepping stone to meeting people. Mm -hmm. And then, Callum, I know it's gone out of my head, but I know that with um, with quite productions who would normally be having monitors, then now is it Q something that people are using? Yeah, so Q take Q take streaming has suddenly come to the forefront. Um, so we've had Q take is, is basically just a software that is industry standard, so everyone has has Q take. Um, and what we're having now is uh, lots of remote streaming. So the people on their phones, on iPads. Um, and so, you know, we, we're, we've started a big HBO show and we've got, I think, 150 people can be on our system at any one time. So basically you rock up, you have an iPad, the iPad gets sunk to the system and you can be on the other side of the stage. You can be in the production office. You can be anywhere on site at Leaveston Studios and still be able to watch the rushes. Um, I've always thought that's not necessarily the best thing um, <laughs> because I, it just sometimes isn't. Um, sometimes less less is more with monitors. Yeah. My husband's a director and I think he would completely agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> I do, we work, we work a lot with, um, with Ken Branner and he is basically a one monitor. It's, that's it, it's one monitor, you know, all the hair and makeup checks, they have to go and physically look. Um, and, you know, he has a monitor for playback and that, that's it. And I, I think that's a great, great way of working. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Thank you, Cal. Thanks for coming along today. Thank you, it's been fascinating. Good, good. Okay, we'll, we'll send across some more details and you can share with everyone. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thanks for that, that today.